16 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a one. one. Singular. One. Singular. All right. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. It's tea. Two free service tea. I want some free service tea. You had the opportunity 10 minutes ago. Let's all stand and sing. We're gonna get started with Psalm 463. My hope is built. Not on slides, but 463. My hope.
seven. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's just rehearsal early. Right. This one's going to be the best. Yeah. <laughs> In front of lots and lots of women, yeah. It's just rehearsal. Wait, with We know it's all right.
be seated. Lucas, come on up. Hey, Lucas. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Hey. Welcome to the Nittany Church. I needed to take a second to, um, apparently last time I welcomed you all, I welcomed you all to the wrong church. So I just wanted to make sure I got the one. The Grays Woods Church. I, I was, I misspoke. <laughs> well, I just wanted to lead us in a quick thought and a prayer. And so I would love for all of us to turn to John 17 on your phones or Bibles, whatever you would like to use. We're going to be in John 17. Starting in verse 20, this is Jesus praying for all the believers, which is so cool because it's like one of, the, one of the few parts of the Bible where we're being spoken to kind of directly today. Like we are the believers that come after Jesus and after the disciples. And so starting in verse 20, Jesus prays, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them, even as you have loved me. So Jesus brings up a pretty profound thought in verse 23, the content of his prayer, he prays that the world may know that the Father has sent him. And what Jesus says is going to be the thing that shows that to the world, that proves that to the world, is the unity of the church, the unity of the body. And I think that's such an incredible thing because I know, I think we can be quick to think that, all right, what's going to help the world know God? It's going to be maybe fancy kind of arguments or, or cool services or like awesome events and wonders. But Jesus says, no, what's going to help the world know that I was sent by the Father is how unified his followers are and how much they love each other. Mm -hmm. And this space, this service right now is an opportunity for us to, to live this out, to grow in our unity and get to know one another. So I just encourage all of us to do that and make the most of this time. Let's pray. Lord God, so grateful for the body, so grateful for the church that you've given us one another that we can serve each other and support each other, Lord, and most of all, help the world know you. Be with this service that you can, yet you can fill it with your spirit and help all of us to take out something that you want us to know. God, motivate us to love and serve one another. Be with the rest of our nights in your son's name. Amen. 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 All right, so we remain, remain seated for this one. I'm going to sing a piece, Perfect Peace. It's number 374. You may not have heard this one in a while if you've heard it. So we're going to do our best here. 374. All right. Tremendous. Okay. Huh? It's going to be tremendous. Tremendous. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. I'm going to be leading it from the bass, but you can follow Cindy from the melody. <laughs> <laughs> Heads up. No. 
pay attention to the lyrics to that, we can kind of call it the community be done. But I'm going to talk some a little bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think um, that song kind of helps me a lot uh, when I'm just not feeling peaceful and just realizing that, you know, Jesus is on the throne. You know, God's in control. I yep. can just rest in that. Um, that's a little bit of what I want to talk about briefly um, um, this afternoon. It's just about um, trusting God, essentially, trusting Jesus. Um, there's a scripture, I'm going to read it first, and then I'm going to kind of come back to it. In 1 Peter chapter 2, at the end, when they hurled, it started in 23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Just stop right there. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And that's just a scripture I've had to come to a lot of different times when I've just kind of felt like, ah, this, this is not fair. This person is like judging me or, you know, they're persecuting me, or oppressing me, whatever they're doing. And I just kind of think like, I don't want to, what about my rights? You know, I need to go and, and get back at them some kind of way. Um, and that scripture just kind of helps me to just stop and go, no, Jesus had every right, you know, to retaliate. He had every means and ability to do that. Um, and he didn't. He entrusted himself to God who judges justly. God who sees everything, knows everything, knows the score, knows how it's going to end, knows your heart, your intention, and what the other guy did. Um, but Jesus trusted God in that situation. Now, of course, this is about Jesus on the cross. So I'm kind of starting at the end, but I want to rewind to um, about 13. You know, and you might have a subtitle in your Bible. It might say something like Submission to Rulers and Masters, which you're probably familiar, familiar with. And I actually want to read from 13 through the end of that again, but I'm going to do it in the message, which um, is kind of just a, I don't know, I enjoy it as a, par it's like a paraphrase. It's a very loose translation just in kind of everyday language, but sometimes it gets the, uh, the point across a lot clearly uh, in kind of our own words. But so the message is 2 Peter 2 chapter, or se yeah, 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 13, and the message reads like this. It says, make the master proud of you by being good citizens. Respect the authorities, whatever their level. They are God's emissaries for keeping order. It is God's will that by doing good, you might cure the ignorance of the fools who think you're a danger to society. Exercise your freedom by serving God, not by breaking the rules. Treat everyone you meet with dignity. Love your spiritual family. Revere God. Respect the government. You who are servants, be good servants to your masters, not just to good masters, but also to bad ones. What counts is that you put up with it for God's sake when you're treated badly for no good reason. And there's no particular virtue in accepting punishment that you well deserve. But if you're treated badly for good behavior and continue in spite of it to be a good servant, that is what counts with God. This is the kind of life you've been invited into, the kind of life Christ lived. He suffered everything that came his way so that you would know that it could be done and also how to do it step by step. He never did one thing wrong. Not once said anything amiss. They called him every name in the book and he said nothing back. He suffered in silence, content to let God set things right. He used his servant body to carry our sins to the cross so that we could be rid of sin, free to live the right way. His wounds became your healing. You were lost sheep with no idea who you were or where you were going. Now you're named and kept for good by the shepherd of your souls. That just helps me a lot. Um, just realizing that, you know, when I want to retaliate and I want to get back, Jesus didn't do that, even though he had every right and he totally could. Um, that helps me. And then when I stop and think that all the people that Jesus had mercy on in that moment, who were all against him, was me as well. So that kind of just helps me to sit tight, you know, wait for God's justice and uh, to be merciful to others the way he was to me. Let's pray. Yeah. Uh, dear God, I uh, thank you for the opportunity to sit and uh, contemplate Jesus and the cross, who we are before you, um, with him and without him, God. If, if not for Jesus, God, we would still be enemies of you and worthy of nothing but your wrath. But instead of that, you pour out your grace and mercy on us. And uh, God, just let us um, take that in, uh, trust you in it, trust you to judge justly, God, and to show that same mercy to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, everybody. Please.
communion. Thanks so much, Rob, for that. Uh, let's stand up and let's start singing a song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no books. It's a key of G. from the sermon. We're going to spend time in prayer and ask God to give each one of us the practical applications that he wants us as individuals to take away from the sermon, which I think is a healthy practice. Not that it's ever wrong to say, here's how we all collectively can apply this, but today we're going to be asking the Holy Spirit to speak to each one of us individually based on the scriptures. What I want to do right now, though, as sort of a primer we just said we're going to have a good time in our Father's house. Let's go. I'd like for us to have a little bit of a good time just in fellowship. Uh, what's your name? Lucas. Sorry, I was almost said Spence. <laughs> My bad, because you were just saying <laughs> I know you very well. And I know you. Um, nice to meet you, Lucas. <laughs> so, Lucas talked about how in unity the world around disciples see the Holy Spirit, see Jesus. And so uh, we're going to have an opportunity for unity, for a little bit of fun, with a primer question to help us getting 
uh, our, our minds wrapped around being thirsty. And here's the question that we can get up, move around the room, and discuss with one another. When's the time you've been the most thirsty? When have you been the most thirsty? We're going to take like three to four to five minutes to discuss that, and then we're going to spend time talking about thirst from John chapter 7. Let's go ahead and stand up. We can mull around the room a little bit. If you're on Zoom right now, feel free to participate in the chat, or maybe Frank will talk to you too. I don't know how that's going to work, but uh, we'll take just a few minutes and talk about when we've been the most thirsty. and dry, as deserts tend to be. And we didn't bring enough water, or at least I didn't think by the end of it we brought enough water. Uh, and we hiked a couple of miles up this ridge and, and kind of through a canyon. And when we got to sort of the far end of the hike, we saw these mountain goats, you know, like beautiful ram and the little goats and stuff bounding around. And so we stopped and hung out there for a long time and just watched them. But while we were there, I continued to get more thirsty. And uh, there was a little stream, but then, you know, the goats are like peeing in the stream. I'm like, I'm not going to drink that much. I'm not that confident in it. So by the time we got back to the house, I had the dry mouth, tongue sticking to the roof of my mouth thing. And man, I was really, really, really parched. I was very thirsty. Uh, and in John chapter 7, Jesus talks about being thirsty. And there's a whole festival uh, that we're gonna that we're gonna describe that has to do with not just thirst, not just physical or even spiritual thirst, but also uh, belonging and listening to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's ability and Jesus's ability to quench our thirst. So let's go over to John chapter seven, and we're gonna spend some time there. And the way I'd like to do this so that it's not monotonous for you all is, I mean, I could just talk and read and, and listen to myself all the time, but. What I'd like to do is have some of us uh, read chunks of scripture at a time. And while we do that, uh, we'll, we'll pause in between some sections and maybe describe some of what's going on. And so can I have somebody read that first chunk of scripture, uh, verse, chapter 7, John chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. Brandon, awesome. Thank you, man. Go for it. Jesus goes to the vessel of tabernacles. After this, he just went around in Galilee. He did not want to get about to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were Jewish, Jewish leaders were there were looking for a way to kill him. When the Jewish vessel of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, Leave Galilee and go to, to Judea, so that the disciples there may see the works you do. The one who wants to become public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. For he just told them, my time is not yet here. For you, for you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it, all, but it hates me because I testified that it, the works are, the works are evil. <clears throat> you go to the festival, I am not going up to the festival because my time is not yet fully come. That he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. At the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, Where is he? <coughs> and among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about, about him. Some said, He's a good man. Others said, No, he deceives the people. No one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. Great. Thank you. All right, so there's a lot going on here that's obvious. And then there's probably some things going on that are a little bit lost in translation because we're uh, different language, different culture, um, almost different religion, different iteration maybe uh, of the same religion, but we don't celebrate many of the same things that our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrate still to this day. And so we may miss a little bit. So 
the festival of tabernacles was the last of the seven obligatory festivals that were on the Jewish calendar. And it, 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 it always happened in the fall. Uh, and it was most similar to our Thanksgiving. It was sort of a harvest festival, uh, but not only that. It was, it was Thanksgiving for uh, God's providence, for um, all that God was going to provide, but it was also a looking back over what God had already done. So it's looking forward what God is going to provide, but also looking back over what God was going to do. And the way that they would celebrate the, the Festival of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths is they would build booths outside of their houses and they would live in them for a period of time as a way to remember when they didn't have a home, when they were wandering in the desert. And the Holy Spirit, God, through the Holy Spirit, guided them for years and years and for a generation through the desert. And they didn't have brick and mortar homes. So they had these booths, these tabernacles that they would live in. And so um, they, they would build tabernacles or, or, or booths, little shacks out of, um, out of palm fronds. And they'd sleep in them overnight uh, for an extended period of time as a way to remember our people used to do this all the time. And God, even though we didn't have brick and mortar homes, or stucco or whatever, uh, God still provided for us. And by the way, we believe looking forward that God is going to continue providing for us. Here's a picture. Uh, I mean, this, this is still celebrated every year by Jewish folks, by practicing Jewish folks, uh, and, and they live in these booths. This is a picture of uh, some booths outside of folks' homes in Jerusalem. And uh, they, they sleep at night in them, and um, this is how they celebrate. And Josephus, the, the Roman historian, said this about it, uh, this holiday. He said, this is the holiest and the greatest festival among the Jews. And it was the only time for the rich and the poor all alike uh, to lay down like a servant and um, to experience life like they would have when they were wandering the desert. That's from the Antiquities of the Jews, chapter 3. Josephus wrote a lot. He wrote a lot of really good stuff. Um, and, and so it happened in the fall. Uh, Leviticus 23 lists the seven obligatory festivals um, that were on. And when I say obligatory, that just means they were standardized. Not that, oh, we have to. Not that kind of obligation. But it was standardized festival every single year. There was seven of them. And this was sort of the, the, the happiest, the greatest one, according at least to Josephus. The Feast of Tabernacles um, looked back on Israel's journey in the wilderness and looked forward also to the promised Messiah, where God ultimately was going to provide for his people. Let's keep going. And uh, if I could have somebody else, Tati, I saw you raise your hand to read earlier. <coughs> Verse 14, if you could pick it up and read 14 through 24, that would be great. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you're all amazed. Yet, because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it didn't come from Moses, but the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead <coughs> judge correctly. Great. Thank you. So Jesus appears halfway through the festival. What's happening halfway through the festival? Well, every day during the festival of tabernacles or the, the festival of booths, there would be a water ceremony in which um, 
the people would go down to the spring, the Gion Spring, which, uh, which actually feeds into the Pool of Siloam, which should pique our interest. Jesus did a pretty famous healing there. Priests would fill a golden pitcher with this water. And again, this still happens every year in Jerusalem to this day. They'd fill a golden pitcher and they would chant Isaiah 12, 3. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation, reminding the people of God's miraculous power and deliverance, especially when he drew water from the rock in Numbers 20. Then together, there was a procession where everybody would walk together up the hill through the water gate towards the temple, uh, carrying tree branches. Again, as a reminder of the booths, the way that God had provided for all the people all that time. They also carried citrus branches uh, to, to signify the harvest, the upcoming harvest. And so they're remembering what has happened in their distant past and also anticipating what God is going to do through providing for the harvest in this water ceremony. They'd, they'd march up the hill towards the temple and they would sing songs together uh, based on Psalm 113 through 118. Psalms like this. This is 114, 7 through 8. Tremble, earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. And so they would recite these scriptures that they knew by heart in the form of songs as they're walking from the pool up to the temple with this water in hand. Here's a, another picture of people still doing this to this day. This ceremony continues, walking from the pool up to today, what used to be the temple. Can I have one more person read uh, John 7, 25 through 36? Who would be willing to do that for me? John 27, great. Thank you, Alan. Did you say 20? 20, 20, sorry, 25 through 36. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. Do you not know him? But I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, When the Messiah comes, he will perform more signs than this man. Will he perform more signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent the temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am not with you for I am with you for only a short time, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look at me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live, scattered among the Greeks, and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? Thank you. Okay, so again, what's going on here? Well, uh, during this time in the festival, during the water ceremony, uh, as, as people are marching up to the temple, uh, the priests would then uh, take this ceremonial water that's in this golden, um, th this golden pitcher and pour it over the altar. And it was meant to symbolize what was going to happen in the Messianic age as prophesied in Ezekiel and Zechariah. So they'd pour the water on the altar and as, it, as the water spilled out, it would flow down uh, through the temple and, and then symbolically through the rest of the city and symbolically, again, keep going. And this was uh, a, a symbol of God's blessing through the Holy Spirit during the Messianic age, the upcoming Messianic age that they were waiting for um, and, and anticipating that God's spirit would flow out from his temple to all people. And they would blow trumpets. And again, this still happens to this day. Uh, they would blow trumpets in the morning 
and at night to commemorate this, this festival. And, and pouring the water out symbolizes the Holy Spirit going out from God's home on earth, the temple, to all people and all nations. And so I think it's interesting that uh, they sort of misunderstand what Jesus says here. That I'm going somewhere, and they're like, well, are you going to the Greeks? And actually, the answer is yes, but that's not what he meant. That's not where he was going and not what he meant. Um, let's, let's continue. I said we're going to crank through as much of this chapter as we can. Can I get somebody else to read 37 through 52, that last section there? Great, Rob, thank you. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Christ. Still others asked, How can, he be the, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Has any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Great. And each one was on off. Thank you. Uh, okay, so as at this climactic point in the middle of the festival, as the whole procession is going up to the altar to pour out this, this, this water, this ceremonial water on the altar, as it would flow, uh, fall down and flow symbolically to all people representing the Spirit of God in the Messianic age, Jesus takes that opportunity to say, are you thirsty? If you're thirsty, you need to come to me. You need to come to me because I'm the one who's really going to quench your thirst. And so he takes this climactic point in the biggest festival. We just got an ESPN update. <laughs> he takes this climactic point in the festival where they're pouring out water on the altar in anticipation of the Holy Spirit being poured out. And that's where Jesus says, are you thirsty? You need to come to me. And Jesus is saying that he's the only one who can quench our thirst. And in just a minute, we're going to split up and have some opportunity to pray and discuss with one another. But I think Jesus is saying to these people who are practicing a religion religiously, they are, they're doing the obligatory things. Uh, they're, they're celebrating, they're remembering they're anticipating in all the ways that have been prescribed in Scripture. Jesus comes to that group of people and says, I know that you're thirsty and you need to come to me. And so let me just ask probably what Jesus is asking us to. Are you thirsty? Or maybe we can assume that we are. What are you thirsting for? What are you thirsting for? at this stage of your life. Isabel and I had a discussion and she had already sort of identified this and whether it was literal or metaphorical and she answered the question at the beginning in both ways and I appreciate your deep thinking and forethought. I'm a little bit thirsty right now but that's nothing like the deep thirst that we all experience when we're desiring connection with God. That's our deepest thirst, but sometimes it presents as thirst for other things. It presents as thirst for relationships, 
it presents as thirst for meaning or thirst for success or thirst for affirmation, thirst for whatever it is. You can fill in the blank. Really what that is is just a symptom that we're thirsting for deeper connection with God. And Jesus is the one saying, are you thirsty? You need to come to me and you're never going to be thirsty again. He says this, remember, to practicing religious people. And I think probably he would say something like that to us as well. Are you thirsty? You need to come to me to get your thirst quenched. So what I'd like to do right now is just take a few minutes and we can split up in small groups or if you'd like, you can pray on your own. But let's just take a few minutes to pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to identify the thing deep down that we really are thirsting for and what that might be an indicator of. Or in other words, what, what's the deepest unfilled desire that you're feeling right now in your life, at this stage of your life? And how can God fill that? We're trying to identify a gap and also identify how God is the one, how Jesus is the one who's going to fill that gap. So let's take a few minutes, either on your own or you can pair up or get in a small group, however you'd like to do it. And let's just pray that the Holy Spirit would help us by identifying the thing that we're thirsty for. Whatever the, whatever the Spirit brought to mind during your own prayer time, um, Jesus is the one who can quench that. And there's no amount of work that we all can do. Um, there's no amount of accomplishment. There's no amount of external relationships that can fill the void that only God can fill through Jesus. And so what I'd like to encourage you with is to talk to somebody about whatever you identified during our prayer time. Because there's something about verbalizing it that makes it more real, right? If you just kind of keep it internal, uh, then it's easy to not deal with it or forget about it because you move on. But when you verbalize it to someone else, maybe even in particular somebody who uh, you encourage to ask you about it later, it's much more likely that it would stay on the forefront of your mind and you'd continue praying about how God, through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, can fill this gap, this desire, this thirst that each one of us have. That's not the only thing that Jesus says, though. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And so I want you to, to recall the imagery that Jesus is using. They're celebrating this festival by pouring water out on the altar that symbolically shows the spirit going out from the altar. And Jesus says, if you come to me, that's going to be you. You're going to be like the altar where the Holy Spirit, this unquenched, uh, this, this forever stream is, is pouring out. And, and Jesus is using water to symbolize the Holy Spirit. And so not only do we get filled or indwelled by the Holy Spirit when we believe Jesus and repent and are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, but we also, when we go through that process, Jesus says, that we become a spring of water in ourselves. We're like the altar in the middle of the temple. And the Holy Spirit can flow out from us as well. And so what I want us to do now is pair up. You can even move around the room if you like and pray out loud with your partner about how the Holy Spirit can move through you to impact somebody else this week. Or maybe another way to think about it is has the Holy Spirit put anyone in your path that you can minister to, that you can serve, that the Holy Spirit through you can have an impact on this week? And so let's just pair up with somebody else and spend some time in prayer about that. And then I'll call us to be back together as we conclude. And, and again, feel free to, to get up and move around the room. Josh, you want to come with me? All right, let's uh, wrap it up and bring it back in.
bring it back in. So, to religious practicing people, Jesus identifies, I know that you're thirsty. Now, part of the onus was on them to identify their thirst and decide to come to Jesus to have their thirst quenched. And in the same way, we're called to come to Jesus to have our thirst quenched. And maybe that means to become a Christian in the first place. Maybe some of us need to make that decision to follow Jesus and experience repentance and baptism. But even for those of us who have been Christians for a long time, we still thirst for things that are an indicator for a need for deeper connection to Jesus. And also, as we experience deeper connection to Jesus, Jesus says, we're gonna, be we're gonna become like a spring of flowing water, like that ceremonial altar, where the Holy Spirit is gonna be uh, coming out from us, pouring out from us, so that God will use us to affect somebody else, to point them towards Jesus. And so, I wanna encourage you tonight to talk about what it is that God brought to mind during that first prayer time. What is it that you're desiring, that you're thirsting for, and how can God, through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, fill that gap? And also to act on what we just prayed about, how the Holy Spirit flowing from us can use you to affect somebody else, whether it's somebody in particular that God brought to mind for you, or it's the random people that we're going to encounter this coming week. That we can be like springs of living water. Let's close in a prayer. God, thank you for Jesus' words, for his teaching, for his example, for his life and death and his resurrection. And through our connection to Jesus, God, thank you that you use us. That, that we can become vessels of your Holy Spirit to impact others. And Father, I pray that we would, that we would be mindful collectively and individually of all the things that you're doing in us and all the questions that we have, all the desires that we have and how you are the one who are going to fill those desires. And also, God, help us to be mindful of how you're going to use us to impact others tonight, this coming week, and throughout our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we close out here, before we have a final song, I only have one announcement, and that's combined midweek back here Wednesday at 7 p.m. We're continuing our series talking about how people have connection to God and to God's church. Uh, reborn, restored, and right hand of fellowship. And this Wednesday, we're going to be talking about receiving the right hand of fellowship. Uh, so come early, come ready to discuss uh, in, in the same vein that we've been doing, we'll probably have some prompt questions. Uh, we'll have some small group Bible study time, and then we'll come back and present our findings. Uh, also, we do have an event coming up this Saturday that Josh has yes. some info about. Uh, between now and Wednesday, for camp people, oh, it's one of your friends. Uh, Saturday, Wednesday, and Friday, is a paintball. I'm hoping we'll meet here at one. Before we head out, uh, Wednesday we are going to discuss vehicles and how many we have to transport. So. Great, so this has uh, been an annual thing. It's going to be our third annual paintball outing. Fourth annual? Third or fourth? Several in a row uh, in Altoona, and it's a great time. So I want to encourage you guys to come on out, um, bring people or whatever. Uh, we'll leave from here around 1 o'clock. Uh, we'll do paintball, probably grab food in Altoona and come back. Okay, so that's the plan for this Saturday. And talk to Josh if you have any, have any questions. Yes. All right, why don't we stand for one last song, which is 731, Soon and Very Soon.
All right, we're I was gonna do it again now. But then I thought you slowed down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was Good job. Yeah. You did slow down. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. What do you say? Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see.